All right, so good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Carlos Barbosa. I am a youth organizer with Teen Empowerment, and I will begin you guys today. All right, so my spoken word is called 398. Um, my words will explain the meaning. <clears throat> All started in 1619, came to North America. The Dutch had a dream of growing money on trees in the area. If we were dark and able, we would put on ships by the ladder superior. Didn't matter if we were from Mali, Ghana, or Nigeria. Taken by the hundreds, cause the more the merrier. I'm talking fleets of ships filled with capacity resembling naval carriers. They? There are manifestations of the barrier with a crippling grip like those of a pit bull terrier. But do you know what's scarier? They get stronger as we get warier. Look at me. What does society tell you to see? Charcoal characteristics gleaming in the sad sun. Blurry perception perpetuated through a gun. Marked members talking negativity with the nun. Man, I tell you, this life ain't fun. Magnificent minds with potent power, picking petals off the frigid flower. Man, I'm tired of it. But we're all in this. But just in case, this is the opposite of literal shunning. The topic is race, but we're still running. Their plan is on pace and very cunning. The invasion? <laughs> the invasion proved whimsical. We're the same but different like the poly exclusion principle. My black sisters, you are formidable. Your presence and beauty is nothing but nutritional. My white sisters, you too are pivotal. Don't feel left out and miserable. My black brothers, they hang and shoot and hit us for our color. My black brothers, we're labeled and chained as soon as we leave our mothers. My black brothers, spread love instead of drugs amongst one another. My white brothers, you might feel smothered since the dust covered, but it's okay, you can recover and rediscover how they're undercover. Now tell me this, have you seen what rose from the abyss? Ships with wheels, not as that makes sense. The shackles never came off. They're on their way to the penitentiary. We're butt slow as a black men, because the tactics are still elementary. And once I'm in, to leave the system, that can never be. Once you go through that entry with the chained assembly, man, that's just rewriting the 17th century. But wait, isn't that a distant memory? No, people look around, this is our humanity. We're all so obsessed with our own vanity, we're not looking through this insanity. My brothers and sisters, we're divided, maybe a little misguided, but we're here to make straight to the lopsided. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve Patrick with the Forum for Community Solutions at the Aspen Institute. Welcome to Boston. Welcome to New England. Yeah. Um, I just have a quick couple of things to take care of, and then we're going to jump into the awesome agenda we have for this morning. I just want to do some thank yous. Um, first, I want to thank all of you who are on the front lines right now doing this work across all the communities that are a part of this network, uh, our new friends who are here for the first time from places like Flint, uh, places like Houston. I want to thank uh, you guys on the front lines because this is a time of um, intense challenge. And I think uh, you know, as I think about the struggle right now in our country for equity and opportunity and justice, the, the one thing that keeps me going in a time when I have struggled uh, myself with keeping on is the work you all do on the ground. And that, that's the work of creating belonging in our society. Uh, we, we can either other or we can create belonging. And 
There's some sense that othering is on the rise right now, and I, I really am inspired by the belonging that uh, all of us yearn for, the equity and justice that all of us yearn for on a regular basis. So I want to thank the community folks who are leading this work across the country who are in this room, not for being here, but for what you do between these gatherings. A lot of us get a lot of juice from being in, in these gatherings together, but it's really the work that you do in between and the effectiveness that you've been able to achieve in between these get-togethers that really makes the difference. So thank you for that work. Uh, thank you for being on the front lines during challenging times. I do want to thank all of you all for being here, but I also want to especially thank uh, our sponsors. You know, um, who the heck knew that this would become some, something of a movement? That's sort of audacious to say. Uh, when we first launched four years ago. And in a lot of ways, um, many of you know me well, so uh, in terms of my own representation, a lot of funders were like, yeah, right, Steve. Um, uh, and, you know, thank God for Melody and Monique and the legitimacy that they bring to, uh, to these kinds of gatherings and, and this movement. But in a lot of ways, we wouldn't be here without their support. So I'm just going to name that J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Best Buy, where is Best Buy? Are you guys in the room? Thank you. Best Buy just stepped up and started supporting this national convening. We really appreciate it. Get to know our new friends at Best Buy. Uh, the Hyams Foundation, you know, the, in my mind, like funders, there are two things, two kinds of funders we like. Funders who are like, here's a check, go do that. We love that. And funders who say, we want to co-create this with you. We share your values. We believe in this work together. And so I would put Hyams in that category. They were really helpful in co-creating this convening, and they wrote a check. Thank you, Hyams. Um, the Barr Foundation, you know, they helped bring us to Boston. They stepped up immediately uh, to support this work, as did the Boston Foundation and Nellie May. In the back of your book, you'll see a list of all those other funders. Most of them are the, what I call the NPR funders, you know, Gates, Ford, Rockefeller, et cetera. Uh, if you listen to NPR, you've heard of them. But we really want to thank all of you all for making this possible um, and for making the gathering we do annually in Aspen possible. So let's give a round of applause to our funders and sponsors. Thank you. All right, let me do the last thank you, which is uh, to the team at Aspen. Can you guys just stand up, uh, staff from Aspen, and you know, let's give you a shout out. Come on. And, and uh, not the least of, of the thank yous to Monique Miles, who leads this work and who rocks it every day. So, without further ado, our leader, Monique Miles. Thanks, you guys. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it is so wonderful to be back. So for those of you who have been with us now for several years, you may know that I was not able to be with you um, in October. I was welcoming, my husband and I were welcoming our daughter Emerson into our family. Um, and so because I missed the opportunity to be together with so many good friends, um, so many important leaders in this movement, so many inspiring young people who are changing outcomes every single day in their community, as well as leaders who are doing the same thing in partnership with our youth leaders. It is wonderful to be back together with you all, to reconnect with old friends, and to see new faces. And I'm so excited about getting to know our new acquaintances and our new partners, and I am also excited about our time together over the next day and a half. I wanted to actually kick off my comments today by picking up on the acknowledgments that uh, Steve started for us, and I wanted to particularly start by thanking our partners here in Boston. 
So when I say that on behalf of the Aspen Forum team, we welcome you all to Boston. I have to actually acknowledge the incredible work and contributions of Neil Sullivan and Kathy Hamilton and Kristen McSwain. You all have been such thoughtful partners in the co-design process, and we have appreciated being in step with you at every single part of this journey. So thank you to the team also at the Boston Pick and the Boston Opportunity Agenda. And we have all of our national partners that I want to also acknowledge, Jobs for the Future, Equal Measure, Harder and Company, the Forum for Youth Investment, and FSG, who, by the way, we are so excited that we are doing our overlap, convening together with them during our time here in Boston. And then finally, I want to wrap up our appreciation by also acknowledging the Aspen Forum team. I am so thankful to work with such dedicated, hardworking colleagues who also just demonstrate kindness to each other in this work that we have the honor and privilege to do together every single day. Thank you to all of my colleagues at Aspen. So I wanted to also pick up on this theme that Steve lifted up. As we were preparing for this convening, we heard from so many of our site leaders across our network. And not only were we inspired by the incredible progress that all of you are making, which I will talk about in a second, we also heard you say very clearly that this is a challenging moment. And in so many ways, I heard you convey that you are doubling down on organizing, on making sure that you do not lose momentum, on making sure that as best as you possibly can, that the barriers that you have worked so thoughtfully and strategically to remove for young people in your communities, that you will continue that progress on systems change. So this morning, I want to acknowledge how on board and committed we are to this partnership to support the incredible progress that you have made. And I wanted to actually share with you all that if you haven't yet had the opportunity to do so, our evaluation partner, Equal Measure, recently released the second year report on system level progress that has been made across this network. And I encourage you to pick up that report if you have yet to do so, because I will walk through some highlights of the progress, but it is exciting and also inspirational to think about what has happened in the two, three years now of this investment. So to begin to share some highlights, first and foremost, what we know is that in across our network of 23 communities, our collaboratives have made significant progress in drawing attention to the needs of opportunity youth. And it's important to unpack this because what that actually means is that not only are things like co-branding happening, co-location happening, um, bringing together system stakeholders that are able to make the type of administrative policy changes that are so critical to removing barriers for opportunity youth, but this work that's happening is also about narrative change. So yesterday we had the opportunity to convene some funders and our conversation really was around organizing and what it is that pushes a movement forward. And one of the threads that was weaved throughout that session yesterday was the real importance that stories and narratives hold in driving a movement forward. So when we talk about the progress that our communities are making, and very specifically the way that communities are seeing a shift around how people understand um, not just what Opportunity Youth know and are able to do, but the investments that also are part of removing these barriers, this note on progress around um, understanding the needs of Opportunity Youth and making the type of administrative policy shifts that are so necessary it's really exciting as we think about how we move from the local progress of communities to the national movement of pushing this work forward. A couple of other quick highlights I want to share is our communities not only continue to implement pilot programs, but we're also watching these programs continue to be broadened as they scale and continue to um, add in additional partners and also additional locations. That's not only locally, but regionally as well. 
And I sort of touched on this a moment ago, but collaboratives are also showing promise toward important policy wins, engaging key civic institutional leaders, and in implementing the organizational changes that influence public policy. And while there's so much to lift up, a couple of nuggets under this heading include um, a site several sites reporting on opportunity youth being at the center of their city's workforce and economic development strategy. We also have news of a site reporting on securing a state level tax levy for opportunity youth. And we've also had sites report on how their local K through 12 system is redesigning policies to very specifically support the needs of opportunity youth to get to better outcomes. So when I tell you that our communities are working with system leaders to truly change systemic outcomes, this is happening not only in a myriad of ways, but it's happening locally in a way that's getting to sustainable change for our young people. And then finally, we were so excited about these outcomes in the report that was released by Equal Measure. It was a particularly exciting moment for us when the Philanthropy News Digest picked this up and also um, noted the highlights that are happening across our community. And what they noted were that our communities, again, are seeing this shift in attitudes vis-a-vis -vis opportunity youth, and this is evidenced by the increased attention to their needs and assets, and also that they are continuously um, filling the gaps in services that are really important to continuing to serve the needs of opportunity youth and bring together local partners to continuously remove these barriers. And then the last piece that I'll say on progress that we're seeing locally, but also really nationally as well, and this note is a reflection of not only the incredible work, as Steve said, takes place in between our convenings, um, but also as part of the national work that so many partners that are in this room today and also partners who cannot be with us today but have been doing this work for 10, 20, 30 plus years. And it is that we continuously at the national level have been able to sustain energy and momentum, momentum excuse me, for this for not only opportunity youth, but for this movement. So when I ask you to join me in celebrating the progress that all of you have made, I want to particularly underline our appreciation, again, not just for the work and opportunities that we have when we are together, but the work that happens in between our time. So please join me in expressing appreciation for the incredible progress of this network. So we are also excited to look forward a little bit, and as we look forward and continue to design in partnership with so many of you, the vision of this work for the future, just a couple of notes to touch on is that we are excited to expand our commitment to rural and tribal communities, and we look forward to and hope to be able to invite new rural and tribal communities into this network. We also, as Steve mentioned, are excited to welcome Flint um, into this network and other communities such as Houston into this network. And it is our hope that we can continuously to expand and grow our family of uh, local collaboratives that are serving opportunity youth and getting to better outcomes. And so on this note, in addition to the rural and tribal expansion and also um, welcoming urban communities as well, we are particularly excited to double down on our investments in youth as experts and youth as leaders in this movement. And our particular, the particular way that we are thinking about this work is um, with this initiative that we've been calling Radical Possibilities internally at the Aspen um, Forum for Community Solutions. And in this initiative, we are excited to make a set of grants to support youth entrepreneurship pathways. We are also excited to support youth organizing. And we are also really excited to um, make a set of grants that are about lifting up youth voice through the use of technology and social media. And so this is the work that is going to come over the next couple of months and over the next years. And we are excited about what that will mean as we continue to expand this network and build on the incredible success that everyone in this room and even people, again, who are not with us today are responsible for. 
And as we think about the progress, as we think about the future and what's to come, we try to partner with so many of you, and especially our friends in Boston, to design a convening agenda that will meet the needs of this network. And to that end, I'm excited to share that we have a myriad of design studios that will include everything from the story of youth organizing in Boston to also the um, Boston Opportunity Youth story, how this work began and have, has experienced multiple waves of collective impact. We're going to hear from system leaders and the young people themselves about what has taken place over time to build the incredible and robust ecosystem that exists today in the city of Boston. Also, as part of our design studios, we're going to hear about employer partnerships and sector organizing and even blended learning strategies from our partners at Jobs for the Future. I mentioned that we are doing this overlap convening with um, FSG. And so tomorrow morning, we're particularly excited that we are going to hear from Marshall Gans, who is often regarded as the maestro of organizing. And to that end, we're going to follow that up by a series of sessions, including sessions from um, leaders of this network who will lift up everything from equity across this network to some of the incredible work that's happening to build not only data sharing systems, but data sharing systems that are getting to continuous improvement um, in communities across this country. And then the final two things that I'll just touch on that we are also excited about, um, we're going to hear from Patrick McCarthy, the president of Annie E. Casey. And he's going to help us continue to think about how we push this movement forward, specifically with focusing on closing youth prisons. We know that that's important to him and important to the work of Annie E. Casey. And we know that that's also important to the work that so many of you are doing daily in your local communities. And for our morning plenary this morning, we are both honored and humbled to hear from Governor Deval Patrick and Hillary Pennington as we continue to look at the values that sustain us and undergird us in this work. You know, Steve talked very specifically about our commitment to equity, our commitment to justice, racial, economic, and social justice, and we're going to continue to explore that and unpack that. And I would say that that really is um, for two reasons. First and foremost, again, in planning for this convening, we heard from so many of you that this is a time in which you're not only feeling some angst about what's happening nationally, but we also know, and we've heard from some of you, that you are feeling vulnerable and you worry about what this might mean for young people at this time. So we want to be so intentional about using this moment to continue to not only do the type of connection that's inspirational, but also continuously set our aspirations together. And so we are excited to do that with our opening plenary. Later today, we're going to hear from the Boston Mayor, uh, Martin Walsh, and we're going to continue to on this di continue in this dialogue on how we explore these values that sustain us, that undergird us, and keep us moving forward. So in closing, I just want to um, say personally how much I appreciate the opportunity to be back together with so many of you. And I want to know how much this time is encouraging. And I hope that it continues to be encouraging for all of you. I hope that this time is a time where we are able to share our stories, and not just our stories of opportunities, but also our stories of challenges, and how so many of you have been able to so thoughtfully and strategically be in that place and also work together through that place. And most importantly, what I really hope for our time together today is that we are able to collectively hold our narratives, our narratives at the center of how this movement is able to go forward. And at the center of that is the power and the impact of our young leaders. Thank you all for being here with us together today, and we are so excited for our time over the next day and a half. Thank you.
going to sit here so I can see. Where you want us to organize? We'll put no, you here. in the middle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to sit here so I can see the clock. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I join with Steve and with Monique in saying how wonderful it is to be back together with you. Um, and I also think that we have uh, an interesting trend. No matter where we go, there seems to be a little bit of travel drama getting to the city where we're going to be. Um, I know that some of you all had um, that kind of a challenge, and Hillary and Duvall, thank you so much for battling planes and bad weather to be with us this morning. Um, and I'm going to introduce in a more uh, fulsome way uh, the former governor and Hillary Pennington in just a second. But I do want to start off picking up on a theme that Monique was talking about a second ago. Um, when we were last together, we were in, in Aspen, and it was October. So it was just about a month before the election. And as Monique mentioned, I know that there was a lot of concern, a lot of angst about the coming election, not just among our network and in our communities, but I think uh, among communities, progressive communities all over the country. And we talked about the fact that no matter who won or who lost the presidential election, that what we saw even more deeply was the turbulence that existed in our country. And that there were many questions and a lot of issues that were being unmasked. And the, uh, the outcome of the election that really proved that, I think was a surprise to a number of people. But my guess is that to a number of you in this room, it wasn't necessarily a surprise. It may have been, not may, it was probably very deeply disappointing. Um, deeply concerning. Um, a lot of that is being borne out right now, but not necessarily surprising. And I think that's because the mask was pulled back, that the curtain was pulled back, and we saw a number of things that you all are confronting and you're working with and you're working against and battling in communities all over the country. And the reality is that while progress is being made, we also know the challenges that face all of us, and in particular, the young people, the young leaders that we're working for and that we're working with. And that the struggles that are facing our communities, the, the economic issues, the justice-related issues, social services-related issues, the cultural issues, the narrative and conversation um, has only become more concerning, has only been more deeply penetrated. And that's, in fact, what we battle every single day to confront and to try and reverse, to try and find higher ground for the good of our communities and, in fact, for the good of our nation. As we're doing that, the work that you all are doing obviously just becomes more and more and more important. You are, in many cases, the tip of the spear. You all see things, understand things more deeply than so many other people do in our communities. And that means that we have to continue our work. As Monique and Steve were saying, we have to find ways to sustain one another, that we have to find ways to make the policy gains that are so critically necessary. But we also have to deal with something that is far more fundamental, something that sits at the root of this issue, something that Hillary and Duvall and I have talked about, and that is the question of who are we as a country? What does it mean to live in the United States of America, to be an American, to be a resident of an American, even if you're not a citizen of the United States? And how are we going to go forward to heal wounds, to heal open wounds that have been that way, not for decades, not for generations, but literally for hundreds and hundreds of years? and the implications of that that we are all feeling very, very deeply. I think that's the fundamental question in front of us, and that's why the values, as Monique was saying, that we all hold so dear, of opportunity and justice and equity, and finding a way forward for those values is so critical to our work. And it's why I'm so proud to be in community with all of you as we do this work. It's not just important for us, and in the 23 communities in which we work, this is important for the country and for the world. So I want to say thank you. And I also want to say that's one of the reasons why we're going to have this conversation this morning and why I'm really thrilled to have these two people here with me. 
Um, I have to my immediate left uh, Governor Deval Patrick, and then sitting to his left, Hillary Pennington, who's the Vice President. And I have to say, Hillary, your title is one of my personal favorites for education, creativity, and free expression. Um, if you only just let's I put know. global in front of yeah, that, right. and it just it, it could only get any better. Um, and I have to say, I first met Deval in the 1990s. Um, and at that time, he was the nominee to be the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the Justice Department. And I will never forget your hearing, uh, your confirmation hearing, and you literally just blew away senators on both sides of the aisle. And since then, you have continued with a storied career, um, being a very successful Assistant Attorney General, um, going on to do work in the private sector, coming back to government uh, to be governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, another opportunity that uh, we had to work together, and now in the work that you're doing at Bain, at Bain Capital, focusing on double impact. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but you epitomize uh, what people call a tri-sector athlete, someone who's worked across many sectors. Um, hey, <laughs> um, worked across many I've sectors. Heard that expression before. Like, so successfully. Like sit up straight. <laughs> um, so successfully, and uh, been thoughtful about carrying the values that we just talked about, that I just mentioned, forward in all of your work. And then Hillary, we met in the 2000s um, in, at the Center for American Progress, where you were a senior fellow. Um, for you, this is a real homecoming, um, being back in Boston. Um, I, see, I have seen your faces. You've made eye contact with so many people in the room with whom you worked. You were a co-founder of Jobs for the Future, um, so I know that they are proud to, to have you back among, among them. Um, you also went on to direct the post-secondary education work at the Gates Foundation, and I think everybody in this room will understand when I say this, you had the enviable task of managing Steve Patrick um, at the Gates Foundation. <laughs> That's actually not possible. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're reaping the whirlwind that is Steve Patrick um, at the Gates Foundation. Um, went on to, after you left Gates, to do some other work in post-secondary and now have the, do the work that you, that you lead at the Ford Foundation, which not only includes education, creativity, and free expression, but for, you know, just for giggles, you toss in Africa and the Middle East as well as part of your portfolio. Um, so I want to thank you all both for being with us this morning. Thank so you. please help me. So I want to start out with, with you, Duvall, and... I'm not global. You should start out with <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Start out with you and talk about the vision that you had when you were governor um, of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and your vision for young people, um, for creating opportunity, um, both in education um, and through employment, and how that compares with what you are seeing now uh, as the work in Massachusetts and the city of Boston continues. How do those two wow. things compare? How many people here from Massachusetts? <laughs> okay, so check me as I go, um, as you did when I was in office. Uh, so a couple things I, I said. First of all, thank you very much for, um, for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored to be with you and with Hillary, and uh, most especially with all of you here who are doing such important work and communities around the, around the country. Um, I, I think I'd start uh, the answer to your question by saying that as a, you know, that I'm a Democrat, but the, the political dynamic here in Massachusetts is not so much Democrat, Republican, as it is insider, outsider. We have a really tight, closed, inward-looking political establishment. So as a, as a newcomer, there were, um, I, I ran a grassroots campaign for both practical and philosophical reasons. Mm -hmm. The practical reason was because that's the only way a newcomer could break in, especially trying to cut the line. Running for, uh, uh, for governor as my first um, venture into elective office. But philosophically, because I really do believe in grassroots engagement, I think, um, I think it's enormously powerful and important to show up where people are in every sense of the term and invite them to see their stake in their own civic and political life. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, listening actively and letting people inform me about what the agenda 
uh, ought to be was important politically and from a policy um, uh, uh, point of view. So engagement, I think, is enormously uh, important. And as a, I would say, that was central to our method and our agenda. It's, there's a, it, where are you, Sarah? There's Sarah. Um, Sarah, remind, was it 10 years ago? Um, I was in office and Sarah and a, and a bunch of students. Um, did you sit in? I can't remember. <laughs> you, they came, you came up to see me, right. Uh, they, they sat in at the, at the governor's uh, office. Um, I think you were still in school at the time and um, uh, with a number of other students to, to, um, to really um, sort of make demands around, uh, around youth violence. And, and you know what? You could, one could, and frequently office holders do, take some umbrage mm -hmm. with that, but that's exactly what citizenship is about. That's exactly what it's about. And, and so, and so the fact that Ms. Sarah reminded me um, this morning that she got all up in my grill. Um, <laughs> did I say it right? I said it right. Um, but I think, I think that engagement was enormously important to how we saw our administration and what we, uh, uh, what we tried to do and how we were looking for um, uh, solutions um, in, uh, in partnership with local communities and local groups and at the, uh, at the state level and against the backdrop of a, of a global economic uh, collapse. So I'd say probably more, uh, maybe I'll stop um, there and I'll come back to picking on, on Sarah um, in, a, in a minute, because I, I, I think part of the equation, and I hope we'll talk more about this, is engagement. Mm -hmm. But the other part of the equation, which for me was a lot more frustrating, not so much in your uh, case, Sarah, but in, in others, like um, in the context of Black Lives Matter or the Occupy movement, was an agenda, uh, or the lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And I hope we get a chance to talk about that. And before I go to Hillary, though, I do want to ask you a little bit more, because now you are at Bain, um, and you're a managing director there and doing double impact work in private equity. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I think a lot of people look, some people look at most of the private sector and, and look at private equity and think, you know, that's the man. That's, that's part of the problem. Yeah. And I'm curious how, why you chose that path and what you are doing that there and how that is consistent with the values that you have and yep. the goals that you see yep. for the state, for the country, yeah. uh, for so, young people. So um, uh, the... Uh, and you might want to tell us a little bit more about the... What word, private equity yeah. is. Um, anybody here know what private equity is? How many of you think you know what private equity is? Yeah. Um, most, it's, it's astonishing how many people thought they knew all they needed to know about private equity for, uh, from the 2010 campaign, or 2012 right. campaign, yeah, right, right. when Romney, Romney was Romney. running. So um, private equity in a kind of stupid, simple way is like buying a house. Mm -hmm. You put some of your own money in, um, you put some debt in, you buy the thing, and, uh, and then you try to make it a better house. You put some... Uh, time and work into it, and you uh, new um, a new roof, new <laughs> new new plumbing, if that's what's necessary, uh, and then you uh, and then you sell it eventually, and you hope you make more than what you um, paid for. That's in simple terms um, what it is, and the way we are trying to do it. Meaning, we're not about financial engineering, just sort of prettying up the balance sheet, and uh, you know firing a bunch of people and making the thing look pretty mm -hmm. and, uh, and selling it up, but actually building businesses because um, job creation is critical mm -hmm. and most jobs, in point of fact, get created in the private sector and not in the, uh, uh, not in the public sector. Ours is an impact investing fund, which is about um, investing for both financial return and social or environmental impact, measurable social or environmental impact. And we're investing in the themes of sustainability, health and wellness, and what we're calling community building. Community building is about companies that intentionally are creating jobs and helping to catalyze economic activity in places of chronic underemployment. Um, it's a new fund at Bain. It's a, it's a new field, a comparatively new field in the United States. Um, Ford's actually uh, been a real f uh, thought leader in this space. It's a more mature field outside the United mm -hmm. States than, mm -hmm. uh, than here. 
And what we're trying to prove is what I have believed for a long time, which is that you don't have to trade return for impact. Mm -hmm. And as we do that at scale, I think it raises some unavoidable questions for investing generally, where we have for a long time, I think, uh, having worked in government and philanthropy and uh, the private sector, I think philanthropy and government have sort of let the private sector off the hook mm -hmm. in terms of um, uh, uh, being responsible um, and taking responsibility for the consequences of their behavior. And uh, I want to show that you can invest behind companies and actually develop a premium um, value in companies that bring uh, a, uh, a sense of responsibility about all of the consequences of what they do. Great. We'll come back to that in a, in a bit. Oh, absolutely. Um, but Hillary, I, I want to turn to you now. And Duvall was talking about Ford's leadership. Um, and as one of the largest foundations globally and with a global reach, um, you all are leaders uh, in lots of different fields. And specifically, I, though I want to think about and talk about the work that we are concerned with here and the moment that we've all been talking about that we sit in right now of um, a sense of un anxiety, um, unrest, un un unsure about where we go. And how has Ford chosen to take on this moment? No, there is a strategic a uh, refresh over a period of time. Where are you all headed now? And what kind of work is coming out of the reset that you all have done that Darren has led at Ford? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for being here. And um, just want to thank you, Carlos, for how you started us off. That was really mm -hmm. um, powerful, amazing. <laughs> um, and it kind of keys to the kinds of things we're thinking about at Ford. So before the election, we had um, begun asking ourselves the question as an 80-year-old foundation that has been working on social justice issues for our entire history. Um, what is it that makes these things so hard to solve? Uh, and why have we made as little progress, actually, over the 80 years on the big issues of social justice that we have worked on? And it led us to make a couple of decisions, and then we've made, uh, we've made a series more since the election. But the first was that we should focus on one thing. If we thought about that the issue that is the single most important issue in this time, as it affects the ability of people to live with human dignity and, uh, and shared prosperity on our earth, and that's the issue of inequality. And so that was a sort of first pass that caused us to think in very, very different ways about all of our programming. Uh, an example that is relevant for us in this room, for many, many years, we as a foundation have worked on education. And we've had a team of people that have worked on K-12 education and a team of people that have worked on higher education. And we've done many, many good things over the course of the years. When we took this frame of inequality, we had to ask ourselves where and how we thought we could make the highest, um, add the highest value. And we decided that we needed to, we would move away from a focus on systems. Uh, and we would put young people at the center. So we've now created one team. It's a team that's called Youth Opportunity and Learning, so it doesn't have the words education in it. And it really, really is focused on, uh, on the experiences, needs, and power and agency of the young people who are most marginalized in our society. And it's trying to ask, it's, uh, and it's, it's trying to ask the question, what would it take if you put the lived experience of those people at the center and you challenge the systems to serve them better? And to, first of all, to see them, and second of all, to serve them better. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many other foundations that are working on systems reform. There will continue to be, because that is a frequent place that people start when they come into philanthropy. Uh, but there really are not that many that are, um, that are focused in this kind of a way. So that's, a, that's an example of one of the changes that we've made. Um, a second thing that we've had to think hard about is the nature of social justice work. And to really realize that when you do this kind of work, for every victory that you have, there will be a reaction against that victory, especially if what you're trying to work against is established structures of power and privilege. And you know, who would think that we, as a funder of Planned Parenthood and reproductive rights for years and years, that we would be at a moment we are in this country, um, even on that one issue, let alone the issues of, of race and racial justice. So we've, we've realized that 
far more important than having a strategic philanthropy and our own strategies is understanding that we have to fund organizations and help them be um, adaptive and help them have the ability to be the first mover when something happens as we are seeing happen now in our country. And so that means um, understanding that social justice is a long game and the single most important thing we can do for our grantee partners is give them general support, not project support, understand that it costs them money um, to do the work that they do and try to help them uh, be able to be the sensors of the kinds of change that need to happen rather than waiting to uh, see what founda a foundation or set of foundations have decided to focus on. So those are just a couple of examples of the shifts that we are in the process of making. Well, and both of you, as I listen to you all talk about your work, I mean, again, you keep drilling down on, it's deep, it's tethered to the kinds of values that we're talking about, finding value, social value, while also in the business of making profit, mm -hmm. of job creation, of agency and equity um, and social justice as you were both doing your work. And I'm wondering, because we here do focus on cross-sector collaboration, one, my first question is, what do you find as you are working in, in partnership with those actors in other sectors? Do you see those same kinds of values playing out? When you don't, how do you respond or react to try and create more space for them and, and, and to, grow, to grow those values as you're doing the, your work in the United States? Mm -hmm. I think cross-sector work, you know, it's easy to pay lip service to it, it's easy to say, I mean, it is essential, it's essential, it, it's necessary, um, but in some ways it's not sufficient. So, you know, I, I think for us, so first and foremost, we do try to be good partners, and we try to focus on the many, many, many interests that are shared, rather than the places where there's disagreement, where we do, where, where we disagree with each other. But, you know, as one of my colleagues at Ford, um, Sanjeev Rao, likes to say, you know, if you only focus on systems change, mm -hmm. which tends to be where cross-collaborative efforts happen, you can only get so far because systems follow rules. And so part, I think, of what you also have to do, or at least we are trying to think about um, at the foundation, is what are the kinds of rules of the game um, that, that the systems um, follow, and how do you change those rules? How do you change... Those, you know, how do you think about not financial literacy, but really working to change predatory lending um, practices, things like that. So talk about backlash. I mean, you're also trying to fracture the architecture that lots of systems have right. grown up on and have grown, gotten larger and succeeded around. Right. You know, we are comfortable that we're gonna be in that space. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's not the right space for every foundation, but it's a comfortable space for us. And it is one reason why we are funding youth organizing and, and uh, movement organizations. You know, I think our feeling is another uh, important piece of change has to be working on power dynamics and on the underlying kinds of beliefs that people hold about who belongs, um, uh, who has value. So that takes you into a different kind of space, and it's, it's a different kind of funding. It's, it is definitely a kind of funding for which you know, we and others who are like us have some kinds of targets on our back. But you know, I think we're comfortable that we're willing to take those risks. So we're trying to balance and hold both. We're trying to still be good partners for cross-collaborative work because there are times when that is necessary and you really cannot move a society forward unless you build a kind of um, governing coalition that's, that's built around solutions. What are we for? And so we, we do try to support work like that, but we realize at the same time that there always has to be outside pressure, that systems don't just change themselves and they don't just always do the right thing. It's a little bit like Sarah coming into your office. So we try to support both kinds of work. And Deval, it calls to question something we were talking about a bit on the phone. I mean, Hillary was talking about systems change work, but also Re, reconstituting the, those very systems and rethinking those rules, which goes to the issue, I think, that, as I was mentioning, is very fundamental to where we are right now. Who are we? Who, who are we as a country, and who will we become? What are we going to work to become, and how do we go about doing that? Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, as you travel, you certainly travel the world, but as you are all over the country, how you, you are thinking about that question right now and what that means for the communities that we're working in right now. Well, I think the, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we 
often uh, talk about and you all work uh, on many of the uh, areas of pressure on opportunity youth. Mm. One of the things that's coming from youth, I think, is much more insistence in lots of quarters on values-based leadership um, and really asking those hard questions about um, why we make the choices we make in policy and business and, and when, I mean, that's enormously important. Mm -hmm. um, and I just I piggyback on what, uh, what Hillary was saying at the, uh, at the end. I can't remember if it was Roosevelt when, as president, um, entertain some group yeah. that was, mm -hmm. you know, all up in his grill, like uh, like Sarah was in mine. And he said, "Those are fabulous ideas. Now make me do it." Yeah, I because, remember hearing President Obama say that. Right. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. because frankly, that outside pressure um, makes is is what the a democratic system that is kind of designed to be slow mm -hmm. move. Mm -hmm. So enormously important. The other part of it, though, I find is that I'm constantly having to choke down um, my, my frustration about when we decide to move. So what do I mean by yeah, that? Yeah, what do you mean? Um, you know, opioid addiction was a big <laughs> problem before it got right. to the suburbs, and then it turned into a crisis, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And there were criminal justice solutions right. before, and now it's a public health now question. Now it's a public health issue, right? right? Mm -hmm. The notion of uh, the experience of workers displaced by an economy mm -hmm. that just moved on and left them behind, I knew that from my experience growing up on the south side of Chicago before it got to white working class people and turned into something we decided to care about. Mm -hmm. You know, there, w there was a, uh, I remember when, when uh, candidate Obama was running for Senate, and right after Katrina, um, he talked about how all those folks um, abandoned on those rooftops after that storm were abandoned before that storm. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I find is I'm, I'm constantly having to check myself um, not to you know, express my frustration that it takes certain issues to reach certain of us before we decide they are issues worth solving, mm -hmm. actually solving, right. and instead um, remembering or realizing there's an opportunity here because that solution actually has to reach everybody. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, the, and, and so I, I think the, the, um, there, are, there are ways in which this moment, which feels so stressful and so worrisome um, and so disruptive, um, are causing us to ask questions we should have been asking all along, mm -hmm. um, up to and including who are we as a nation, and are we, we, going to take responsibility um, for defining that, or are we going to wait for somebody else uh, to do it for us? And I think more and more people are saying it's up to us uh, to define that, and to define that in an expansive, um, uh, big-hearted way. Right, and how we hold on to our values for justice and fairness when it would be very easy just to be angry right. and frustrated. Right. Um, I think the clock has been doing some interesting things. I think <laughs> it is time for me to go to work. <laughs> it's not just sleep deprivation. Um, I think I should be going to questions and bring in the audience um, at this point. I'm going to start, though. I know I want to start with some of our youth leaders, and I want to start with with Ryan um, and find out, is there a, someone with a microphone? Okay, great. Um, and uh, get your reaction response to the conversation that we've been having up here. How does it resonate with you? Um, how does it make you think about the work that you're doing? My thing is, um, these seem like the good people. How do we get to the other people? How do we move the needle? <laughs> I feel like you. I'm from New Orleans, so I was on the rooftop long before. I'm from New Orleans, so I was on the rooftop from New Orleans. Long, right. mm -hmm. long before I'm one of those people that was supposedly left. Right. But how do we move the needle long, be, you know, long before time, before right. it's too late? Before we have a lot right. of organizations and a lot of people that's doing great work, a lot of collaborators, a lot right. of um, systematic approaches, a lot of practical approaches. Right. What's the appropriate door? What's the right door to walk through? What's the right procedures and steps to actually meet it before it's too late? Yeah. That's probably my so biggest concern. I, is it all right if I start? Yeah, please. So um, uh, Ryan 
Um, one thing I would, I would say, and I, I want to say this um, respectfully, but I want to say it bluntly, is um, not to worry, not to spend too much energy on what the right door is. Crash through as many doors as there are. There's a whole lot of, um, there's a whole lot, when I, when I was um, uh, in, uh, in high school in the late 60s and 70s, we got a lot of pushback about our behavior on, on, on whether it was appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so um, we spent a whole lot of time working out what was appropriate instead of getting to the underlying uh, issue. And I will express, if I may, uh, some frustration when in office um, with, uh, with um, uh, the Black Lives Movement, for example, or Occupy, for that matter. Fabulous that everybody was organized. So fabulous, so much energy. Um, but, it, but when asked, when I would ask and others, you know, what's, what, we, what we used to call our standard list of non-negotiable demands, what were the demands? What we mostly heard was totally legitimate anger and frustration and a demand for respect. And by the way, they and you don't need me or anybody else to tell you that's legitimate. That's legitimate. But then, and what do you need? And what, you know, here I am sitting in the office. I have, I had some juice um, as, uh, as governor. I couldn't do stuff all by, my, all by myself, but trying to get folks to actually articulate what they wanted to happen that I could deliver was incredibly frustrating. So I, I get, and I know that I think part of this work has been helping to crystallize what that agenda is in New Orleans or, or elsewhere or nationally. I think that's incredibly uh, important. Um, and then I'm going to say something that probably is a little inappropriate for some of you who work in not-for-profits. Um, if you want to move policy, you've got, got to get involved in politics. You just have to. It's just, you know, you, it, may be, it may be, you know, soiled and, in a, and, and tawdry and you don't want to do that, but there are a whole lot of folks who don't listen to you because they don't think you are ever going to vote them out of office. And if you, so organizing around registration and organizing around actual turnout and more to the point, stepping up and challenging yourself uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a candidate for office at all levels is just hugely important in moving the needle and moving the agenda. And in fact, it's cha more challenged as it becomes right now, more important to be involved. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I agree. And I think, you, you know, you guys are already far ahead, I think, of where we were because you are organized and you are, and you are figuring out how to build um, cross-identity, cross cross-issue kinds of coalitions that are about what are you for. Um, and I think that is an essential piece of, of sort of pushing through and breaking through. I think one of the, um, so all of the stuff that you said, I would agree, running for office, you know, becoming the leaders. Uh, and not waiting for there to be better leaders, I think is really essential. I think also though we all face, um, not so much on the national level where it is essential to do the kinds of things you've been talking about, Duvall, but uh, at a personal level. Um, Steve was talking before about othering and belonging and the beautiful you know, kind of words and work of John Powell. And he says some things that are controversial and hard, I think, for a lot of us who are angry to hear. Mm -hmm. So he talks about how at a time like this, um, People are feeling in the country, you know, there's, there's just too much change, and so I'm going to withdraw to my tribe. And that doesn't justify withdrawing to your tribe, but he talks about the difference. What do, you, what do, what do movements do? What do countries do? Um, what do societies do when there are moments like that? And he, he talks about two different kinds of narratives. So one is what he would call a breaking narrative. So that's a narrative that says, um, you know, uh, that, we off that we also use, which is to say, we're the resistance, you know, we're, we, it, it is us versus them. Uh, and then he talks about the importance of what he calls bonding, bonding narratives. We are all, the, you know, we are all the same. There are, there are things in those people that, that if we can figure out how to relate to, um, we can't convert them to be 
everything we want them to be, but we can create, we can focus more on our shared humanity. And I think that that is something I see in young leaders as an enormous power and strength. So it's both owning the anger and organizing, never letting that go. But also, I see just stunning um, capacity to imagine and reach out in ways that are, that are really bold. And I think, I think we need both things. Uh, I don't think you build good societies on, uh, on anger alone. But that's really super hard work. And I know from having been in a meeting the other day with a number of you, some of you who are here um, right now, LaShawn calling you out, um, which was youth organizers strategizing around how you move a policy, a policy agenda. And you know, one of the things that people talked about was, was the cost to them of showing up um, over and over and over again with their own stories uh, and, and how being in this work is traumatic and hard. So I think the other thing I would say to you is to figure out ways to take care of yourselves and take care of each other because it is really, really hard work. And um, that's super important to do too. And I think easy to forget. Yeah. Uh, great. Thank you. And I now also want to hear from Shawnice and Kimberly. What time? I have five after that. Oh, great. Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is Shawnice Jackson. Like, I'm a member of the National Council of Young Leaders. So we are current and former opportunity youth who are leading a grassroots organizing campaign for Opportunity Knife to basically harness and leverage their civic power and voice. Um, so we're on the ground uh, across the nation organizing our peers. Um, so while we're tackling these issues and challenges, I feel like we're also living them out loud in both our professional and personal lives. Mm -hmm. So in understanding that, you know, system change, narratives change, like you guys mentioned, it's multifaceted, it's multi-general, in essence, it takes a long time. So, like Hillary, like you've been basically doing this for 80 plus years. Monique mentioned something really important earlier, which was like maintaining this energy and this momentum. So my question is essentially around how do we, as young people, continue to keep the faith, continue to move forward while being confronted with these issues and these challenges on an everyday basis? Wow. Did everyone hear Shanice's question? Shanice, right? Shanice. Did everyone hear the question? I'm yeah. okay. I'm filibustering because I'm trying to figure out an answer. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a profound uh, question. I think Hillary touched on some of it just, uh, uh, just now. I was at a, I was at a dinner in uh, Washington, a convening of people who are doing impact investing not too long after the, um, after the election and everybody was talking about you know, the end of the world as we knew it and, and how much of this incredibly dark divisive vision had taken hold in the in the campaign and through the election and someone asked me um, what I thought and I, I, I stood up and I said you know I feel like um, I owe it to my ancestors to be optimistic um, because you know the, yes these are trying times um, they are unsettling and worrisome uh, uh, times they are distressing times but it's not the first time in the long journey of black and brown people in this country where we've been up against it. And, um, and that resistance and persistence and a vision of tomorrow, and I do think that's important, it's important to have something alongside your anger um, a, uh, a destination uh, you're driving to and some actions you're taking toward that that are their, their own source of fuel. And making common cause with other people. You know, you, you, you might not be surprised. Um, uh, and if you are, you aren't doing it uh, enough. There are an awful lot of people who crave justice and equity. Um, people um, uh, who usually, who sometimes keep to themselves, people who don't look like they care about that sort of thing, but who are worried too, but they're uncomfortable with the conversation and some of the language uh, around it. And um, uh, as frustrating as it is, I think for me anyhow, when it comes to issues of race and civil rights, 
always to feel like I have to make other people comfortable before we can have the conversation. I do, uh, I do think that there is a moment right now where um, the times have caused people to be more open to those questions than we thought. Um, a whole lot of people who hadn't been woke until, uh, uh, until now. Yeah, and I think I just would add to that. I mean, you, you are the largest generation in American history. You, and you are different than older generations. You really are. And all, you know, I'm sure you all see the polling information that shows this. You, you, and, and so, meaning you're much more tolerant. You, you want a world that's a different kind of a world. So I think that's really important to hold on to. I can say sitting up here now um, as, at 60, and uh, having started Jobs for the Future when I was 29 with a partner who was 60, um, and seeing so many people in this room that I have worked with for over 30 years, that the people sitting in, the, in this room who are with you, who are, who are young, where you're called into this work and you're starting out now, you will still be working with each other in some way, shape, or form 30, 20, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. You will. And, and you will have gone from whatever you are doing now to consistently more and more, you know, other kinds of leadership roles. You're in leadership roles now. So you are going to be a network for each other's lives. And I think that's really one of the very important things about this work across 23 communities. So know each other, stay close to each other, stay in touch with each other. Um, and steal each other's best steal ideas. Steal each other's best ideas, give each other credit for those best yeah. ideas, but steal them and use them. And, uh, you know, I, there's, a, there's a really beautiful story, I think, also, that this is, you know, I think part of it is also spiritual work. And there's a beautiful, beautiful American Indian story, Native story, about the fact that in every human soul there is a good wolf and a bad wolf battling for that soul. And there's a beautiful story about a child asking an elder, um, which wolf wins? And the elder says, the wolf you feed. And so I think that that's also something just for all of us in this really, really dark time is to not let ourselves become that dark thing, but to feed that other wolf <laughs> and show that other wolf. And that's, that's also the kind of energy that you give each other and tap into with each other. So I think places like this where you come back and touch base and refresh and rejuvenate and go out again are really important and to, to find them and keep doing them. Yeah, I, I also think in keeping with your comments about John Powell's work, I mean, if we look across the scope of history and, and American history, there are these points in time where we had the opportunity to take the other path, um, to, to do what I would argue is the right thing. Um, and there are wedges that consistently get used to divide people who have much in common um, and, to act, and to pit them against one another. And, you know, kind of in the words of that famous Malcolm X speech, you know, it's like you get, you get bamboozled, you get hoodwinked. Um, and this is an opportunity, and you all have an amazing opportunity, given the diversity in the room, you know, geographic, racial, ethnic, um, sexual orientation, all the diversity that sits in the room to take the right path and to lead the country in the right direction. Uh, and to counteract what we've seen happen over and over again that has diminished our power and our ability to get good things done. Um, I want to turn to Kimberly, and then I'm going to open this up to uh, a larger Q&A. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kimberly Pham from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, representing Project U-Turn and National Council of Young Leaders. Uh, my question is very similar to what Shanisa said. Um, how do we, as emerging and developing leaders, restore balance during a time that is really challenging, um, during a time while we are still healing, as well as committed to doing the social work justice, which at times seems to be separate? healing and trying to do this social justice work is like you need to kind of heal first, but sometimes we're so passionate about it that we just do it all at the same time. So mm -hmm. how do we kind of restore balance, just not among our peer groups, but also with the adults and partners that we work with? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So holding both of those things in balance um, at simultaneously? I think that's super hard. And I, I, I you know, I think it is to do the kinds of things that we've just been, we've just been talking about. And um, 
to step back when you feel like you're getting too close to the edge. You know, you, 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 you get to take care of yourselves. You don't have to al always do the thing that is the most hard. And, you know, I, I do see a lot among all of you of ways in which you, you take care of each other. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think another thing, um, you know, again, going back to that meeting we were at together, LaShawn, uh, there was a really powerful um, discussion about mental health, which gets left out over and over and over again. Uh, what does it mean to have health and, and well-being? And they had uh, been trying to think about what a policy agenda would look like for that. And they asked groups of young people to talk about health. But the word clouds that came up for that had to do with all the things that are positive, what it means to have positive um, health and positive well-being. And I, it's, it sort of really struck me because it's, we, we tend to start so much with the things that are negative, um, the, the lacks that cause us not to have a feeling of well-being, and these young people had generated a really powerful vision of what well-being looked like. And so I think that that's, that's another thing to make sure that when we're talking about what we want to before we're thinking about the things that help people thrive mm -hmm. and not um, remediate, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not, not let us be characterized as only about um, the trauma or the challenges that we face, but the potential. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hence, yeah, opportunity is, I mean, the language that we use there. Mm -hmm. or well, yeah, I, you probably want to get to the others. Um, I, I love the question. I was, I was thinking that um, in some ways, at least for me, social justice is healing. Um, there's so much um, significance uh, to the work. I'm not diminishing the wear and tear, but there's so much significance to the, um, to the work that uh, uh, it, it has its own sort of regenerative um, uh, quality. I'll also say that I learned a lesson um, and I'll say many of the lessons I've learned have been randomly taught by the angels who just were in my way uh, at any, any given time. And there was a, I remember once there was a, I was home on vacation in the south side of Chicago where I grew up and I was um, going to meet somebody and I was late. And I went hustling um, to the local bus stop to get a city bus. And I got there just as the bus was, um, was rolling up and I jumped on um, and we started to move and I reached in my pocket. They still had coin boxes in those days and I realized I didn't have enough money for the fare and I stood there looking ridiculous and the, and the bus driver said sit down son and pointed to the chair closest to the door and I knew he was going to let me have it um, and I started to explain I'd been away. I was in a hurry. I didn't realize the fare had, uh, had changed and there's this great old black guy with his grizzled beard who uh, uh, turned from the road and looked at me and sized me up instantly the way people who serve the public can do. <laughs> and, uh, and he looked back at the road and he said very quietly, he said, just pass it on, son. Just pass it on. Tiny act of grace that taught me um, that I have some responsibility to pass it on. And so your work is generational work, right? It's a responsibility you have. It's not, it's, it is about the here and now, but it's not just about the here and now. Mm -hmm. It's about your younger brothers and sisters and the generation um, uh, to come who are counting on you and us to do what we can in our time to make it a little bit better for, uh, for them and then to teach them how important it is to take up, uh, take up that challenge. That's beautiful. I don't know if you were talking, how many of you remember who were with us when we were in Aspen and we did the panel with uh, David Domenici and James Foreman Jr. And James talked about his father, James Foreman Sr. in the civil rights movement, who talked about that very thing, mm -hmm. you know, doing the work and doing it for the next generation mm -hmm. um, as well. So consistent themes there. So I wanna open this up to you. Um, are there questions in the audience for Duvall and, and for Hillary? Got a question here and then a question I'll here. Go to LaShawn first. Okay. Where's LaShawn? Here. Hello, uh, wonderful panelists. Thank you guys. Um, I've enjoyed this entire section. So, my question is um, since you guys are both global leaders, 
Um, and we think about cross collaboration and even opportunity youth in America, um, the number of opportunity youth across the world is even higher. So my question is, what does cross collaboration across the world look like? And what do you think the biggest challenge will be in building that global movement and connecting youth across the world? I love that question. Yeah. <laughs> That's something we're actually thinking a lot about yeah. at the Ford Foundation because we have 10 offices around the world in places like Cairo where there was the Arab Spring, in South Africa where there's the student, you know, the Fees Must Fall movement that students are um, organizing around. So we are trying really hard to look at the kinds of issues that young people are organizing themselves around in each of the places in the world where we have uh, regional offices and thinking about what, what would it mean to connect those young people to each other and to give them relationships, uh, voice, um, some kinds of shared things that they, that they might be organizing about. I think one of the things that is very positive about social media, even though there are many things that are challenging about it, is that it makes, you know, I think for many young people, they feel both an identity of the place, the particular context where they live, and they feel an identity with other young people who are like them globally. So I think that that's an enormous, uh, an enormous asset, and we're trying to figure out how we can network the young leaders that we are able to see and support into more of a global kind of network. And what that looks like, we'll have to get co-created with people like you guys. So stay tuned. And come to our last session. <laughs> this is a trailer for that session. Um, we'll be talking about more of that there um, with Patrick Gaspard, who was the US ambassador to South Africa, um, and what he is seeing globally and tying that to the work that we're doing here. And it's something that we're thinking a lot about as well. Great question. Yes, Dorothy. My name is Dorothy Stoneman. Hello. Hi, Dorothy. Uh, I'm going to do something I didn't plan to do in the spirit of the boldness that you have encouraged here. And that is to say that Shanice and Ryan and Kim and LaShawn have done what Governor Patrick has asked them to do, which is to produce a platform, to produce their solutions, their recommendations. That hasn't been clear because they've been in the role of asking questions. But I would like to suggest and encourage that, Sh that Shanice take your recommendations to the stage, deliver them to Governor Patrick, and invite Governor Patrick to become a permanent advisor to Opportunity <laughs> Youth United. That is so... That is... Come on up here. That is so classic Dorothy Stone. I love it. I love it. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Shanice. Really nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Fabulous. Any other? Before, I can take one more bold question. <laughs> have, have all of you guys in the room seen this? Because it's really powerful. It's really good. I'm sure you all have. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jared Jones from the south side of Chicago as well. Um, I'm a current City of AmeriCorps member, um, also a member of the National Council of Young Leaders. My question is, how do we as young leaders build sustainable systems to counteract systemic racism? Because in my view, it's like we can help as many people as we can, but until we disrupt the system, we're going to continue to reproduce like opportunity youth no matter what. So how can we counteract that to like move the needle permanently mm -hmm. as young leaders? Mm -hmm. Let me start. Um, it's a it's a hard and important uh, question, Jared. Um, I think that um, my generation and generations before have been asking too. I do think um, you know I, I I feel like I reached a point in my uh, in my life where I'm prepared to say racism is other people's problem. Get out of my way. Um, I do think uh, some of it is about organizing uh, around power. Frankly, um, it's uh, it's um, it's uh, organizing politically, it's organizing economically, um, it's, uh, it's business and job uh, creation, and it's making demands that you take a rightful place, a rightful place, in fact, that you seize a rightful place alongside um, uh, people in, in, uh, in power. I do think there are all kinds of, you know, the, um, uh, uh, earlier we, had, we were admonished to consider the, um, uh, the narrative, I think you said, or the storyline. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I think it's, um, it is true that there is this storyline that plays in the back of a lot of people's minds and in the front of some, um, that uh, people like you and me are not capable, um, we're not smart, we can't be trusted, um, you know, we, all that stuff, all that stuff. That doesn't define who I am. It doesn't define a whole lot of people uh, I know. And when it does define people um, I know and have met, it is not um, limited by race. Um, so, so I think some of it is old fashioned, uh, you know, about being clear about who you are and what you represent and being that all the time, no matter what the environment you find yourself, uh, you find yourself in. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are two systems. We, uh, we heard about them in Carlos's words that we all should stay really, really focused on, um, which, in which structural racism is particularly um, insidious and damaging, and that is criminal justice and education. And not to let, you know, there, there has been a lot of consensus evolving over hard work of many years about how to change those systems. Uh, particularly, you know, if you think about the momentum that was gathering around criminal justice reform before the election, which Congress was too chicken um, to pass and do anything about. But and, many states have. But many, many states have. States so I think we have to keep organized around that particularly pernicious thing and to keep um, lifting up and showing uh, the structural ways in which that happens and gets repeated and repeated, as you th said, I think, Carlos, in your words about it's a, it, it's, it's a system you can't, you know, when you get in it, you can't get out. That we have to change. And then I think with education, um, we, we, we have to keep shining the light on who our education system serves well and who it doesn't serve well and where there are places and ways and structures which start to begin to try to change that. And I think that's a lot of the work that Collective Impact and many, many of your communities are about. And if we could make a dent on those two systems, we would be making a pretty big dent on the, a hugely hard set of problems. Great. Well, I think I've been ignoring and paying attention to the clock because it's doing a lot of different things, but it's flashing red now. <laughs> so um, I'm going to wrap up, but I'm just going to ask you all very quickly as we close, the comment you would have about hope and sustaining the work that our communities are doing. What comment do, would you leave them with um, as we go into our sessions the next couple of days together and then they go back home? We'll start with either one of you that might want to go first. Oh, you know, I, I think um, to keep focused on what it means to have radical love and radical belonging, Dorothy and Youth Build and all of you youth, uh, the, the Youth Council, I think, personify that. Uh, and, and to have that be the wolf you feed. That would be my end comment. Yeah. Wow. Can we stop there? I mean, it's yes. perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. I, I, you know, if the, if the wolves are um, fear and hope, um, you know, fear is a time-honored device mm -hmm. to govern and control. It's end divide. It's been used around the world in this country and in this country, and it's in use um, right now. Um, scripture says fear is useless. Only hope matters. Uh, and I, that's been the experience of my improbable life. It's been the experience of, uh, of so much of your good, good work. Uh, and it is hard and risky and frequently um, disappointing, but it is the only thing that moves the needle. So if you believe in change, you have to commit to hope and keep refreshing that and spreading it everywhere uh, and every time you can. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Please join me in thank you, Hillary and Paul. Thank you. So, um, Monique's going to come up and transition us, but I, I can't believe it, it took me to figure this out. We were on a planning call for the conference, uh, Melody and Monique and I, and, and we realized uh, that Deval Patrick was going to kick this off, and then later Patrick McCarthy's going to speak at this uh, convening, and then we already heard we're going to close with Patrick Gaspard. And so 
I can't believe Steve Patrick figured this out, but there is a, <laughs> there's a through line in this conference. So we had unofficial t-shirts made up because, uh, frankly, I don't think Melody or Monique would let me make them official t-shirts <laughs> that are, come from, a. I think the quote is from uh, Margaret Mead's lesser known uh, cousin, Patrick Mead Patrick, that uh, you have our logo on the front and on the back, the quote from Patrick Mead Patrick, never doubt that a small group of Patricks can change the world. That <laughs> we would like to present this to Governor Patrick and thank him for his leadership. That's great. Um, but That's great. not to it. be left out, um, Hillary's very used to me re revising things. <laughs> uh, I, I edited quite a few grant uh, uh, write-ups for Hillary, so she's used to the, the line. We didn't have enough money, Hillary, to make your own, but <laughs> this, this one, uh, thanks to the power of the Sharpie, also says never doubt the Penningtons either, so we want to thank Hillary for her leadership. <laughs> thank you, you guys, for being a part of this. Monique, please get me off the stage. <laughs> Thank you again to our opening speakers. I am going to transition us. Um, I know we got to move quickly into our breakout sessions, but what I wanted to encourage you all to do is to share your convening experience with us. I want to call out and appreciate my colleague, Christina Kostic, who did an incredible job of creating a social media toolkit. I want to remind you all that this information is in your folders. We want to encourage you to use our hashtag, OYIF, to share your convening story. We're going to put that together in a Storyfy and retell your convening experience. We're going to transition now into breakout sessions, but we will reconvene here at 11.20 for our lunch plenary, where we will hear from system leaders and the mayor and all of our youth leaders. Thank you all for this morning and see you later today. <laughs>